Welcome to Luxoft Tech Talks, a series of podcasts in which IT gurus share their knowledge and discuss the latest trends and innovations in the world of IT. We are going to cover the most recent developments in the programming languages, frameworks, and technologies that are shaping the future of the software industry. This new format of online learning is part of Luxoft Learning Management and Development Services rebranding. Please share your feedback in the comments to let us know what speakers and topics you would like us to cover in later installments. And welcome to this Luxoft Tech Talk. My name is Anno Embrechts. I'm here to, together with my colleague, Peter Wessels. Hi, Peter. Hi, I'm Peter. And uh, we, will, we will be talking about migrating your project from Java 8 to a more recent Java version. Um, and because Java 14 is being released very soon, we'll also talk a bit about Java 14. So we have done this, uh, this migration uh, at, a, at a project that we work together on, and we just want to share some best practices about migrating uh, from Java 8 to a, a newer Java version. And because Java 8 is um, a long-term support version, I can imagine a lot of people are still stuck on Java 8 because it's, it's a long-term support version or because uh, it's just an old code base and you have maybe be thinking about migrating it. And we just want to provide some tips on how you could handle this and um, uh, what we did to make sure that the migration was uh, successful. Um, so this is a bit about ourselves. I'm a software architect at Info Support and I'm also a conference speaker. Um, and Peter, could you tell a bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah. I'm a, a T consultant at uh, Info Support, the same company. And we work together at Dancing. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's about me. Great, thanks. So, Peter mentioned it already. Um, we did a Java upgrade uh, at Translink, which is uh, the project that we worked on. Uh, it's a Dutch company that provides the ticketing system for the Dutch public transports. And um, we started right on the date that. Um, Java 11 was released, which was in September 2018. And we had around 30 different components, um, and we wanted to migrate them from Java 8 to Java 11. I think the reason mainly was because we had some time on our hands, so we were a team that had been used to creating software for quite some sprints already, and we were preparing for a big new project, a big greenfield project would start that would also use these 30 components that already existed. And we thought, while we are working out the requirements for the new project, why, just, why don't, don't we use the time to upgrade our components to the newest uh, Java version? And we worked on this migration for uh, a few months. And I guess we finished somewhere in the month of December. We didn't keep track of the actual ending date. So that's why I put during December right here. Um, and uh, we were actually one of the first uh, projects that tried to do this because Java 11 was just released on the same day that we started. So we came across some interesting things. Um, that will be a part of the, the talk. Now the talk will be structured as follows. Uh, at, at a few times I will tell something about the new Java versions, uh, also the new release schedule that has been in place for a few years now. Uh, and also a bit about new features that you can access if you have uh, migrated to a newer version. And uh, to keep things interesting a bit, we also want to show you uh, a migration th that we're doing live during the talk. And I um, think it's a good idea if Peter tells a bit about that um, to introduce um, the application that we're trying to migrate while, while we're also doing this talk. And he will also tell a bit about why we think this is useful so Peter, could you tell us a bit about that? So um, I'm introducing OpenHub. Uh, OpenHub is uh, a platform where you, which you can use to connect all your uh, sensors and lighting. Uh, if you have a smart home at home, which uh, Google Home or uh, uh, Philips Hue or uh, Ikea, Tradfree, uh, you can use uh, those sensors and those um, uh, lighting to control, or you can control those lighting. Let me show you the project we are going to migrate. Uh, it's open up and it's quite a big project. Uh, it has lots of bundles, uh, as you can see here. 
And so it's quite a challenge to migrate this because there are a lot of different dependencies involved. And um, we are migrating OpenHub because yeah, so we got a question because uh, of our manager that want, uh, that is very uh, want to uh, install OpenHub open uh, at home and he, did, he refused to to run it on Java 8. So therefore we got the, we got a challenge to migrate it to Java 11 first, and then we're going to migrate it to 13. And I'm going to show you some best practices. Um, so we have the project here. The project is structured as follows. We have the build of materials. So uh, these build of materials define the versions you're using. If you're not familiar with build of materials. And uh, there are a lot of, different build of materials involved in this in this project so there are a lot of different bundles that use different uh, versions of different dependencies so it's it's quite a challenge and we're gonna uh, we're gonna see that in just a minute and uh, so there is a, a build of materials uh, for this point this project uses maven so you have uh, as you have seen uh, we got the dependencies in maven some versions, some dependency management, plugin repositories. So um, yeah, so that about the project, we got a demo, we got some features, uh, some integration tests. Um, yeah, so that's uh, OpenHub Core. And what we're going to do is we're gonna prepare the environment. So that's very important because um, you're gonna do this, if you're gonna do this migration, it is mostly not a one day job. It takes some time, some weeks. So if you prepare your environment, it's, it's very important because then you can shorten your feedback loop. And we're gonna see that, um, uh, we're gonna see that in just a minute. First, if you use IntelliJ, we're using IntelliJ, but you can use Eclipse if you'd like. Uh, then you have to set your uh, project structure. Um, uh, where is it all? To look for it, o always have to look for it. Sorry? Module settings. Module settings. So we have to uh, look, I have to look it up. I don't do that too often. Yeah, so we have the, the project settings and there we have to change some things. So firstly, you have to select your product SDK so at the moment it's uh, 1.8, uh, but we're going first to migrate it to Java uh, 11. So we select Java 11 here. Um, the language level is we've also selected to 11. And uh, here, if you click on modules, you have to select the Java version again. I think I have to do it once it, okay. So we have to do it at the root org openhub.core, so this way, cool. So project SDK 11, language level 11, and here language level 11. So that's fine, all the other stuff you don't have to care, uh, care about for, for now. Cool, so another thing, because it's not a one day job, you want to set some aliases. So I have some aliases prepared for this, for this uh, purpose, I have if you can see it, Java 8, and now I can switch to Java 8. You can see it here, Java 1.8.0 and it's got 2.4.2. Uh, because, because you want to switch very often between Java 8 and Java 11, you can, uh, you can define some aliases to switch to Java uh, 11. So if you see, now we are on Java 11 and we can, um, we can change it to 13 and then we have Java for, uh, version 13. It's, it sets your Java home, yes. Um, so you can, you can change it very often. Often you want to change between projects. Some projects are on Java 8, some are projects on Java 11. So it's very convenient to change it. Um, also in the, product, in, in the process of migrating your project, sometimes you think it, it, it is migrated, it, it works or you have built success. 
and then you you figure out you're just on Java eight. So that's a that's a pity then. So you have to uh, be very conscious um, um, which Java versions you're on. So it, this helps. So let's just start and start for a bit. What we first going to do is we we go to the main pom.xml and we change this version. So we're going to change it to 11. Um, yeah, and just, just see if it's compiles. That's the first step, right? So just check if it's compiles. So we're going to Java 11, and then we say Maven compile. So that is, this is the exciting bit. Mm -hmm. So it's going to download a lot of stuff, and it failed. So it failed. And why did it fail? Because the enforce enforcer rules have failed. So this project is actually very clever. They defined in the in the Maven enforcer which Java version is uh, supported by this project. Or uh, so if you go to the Maven enforcer plugin, it's right at the bottom, I think. Yeah, here we see it. So they, they configured the Maven Enforcer plugin to target 1.8.0 till 40 uh, and excluding 1.9. So because this is in a round uh, bracket, uh, 1.9 is not uh, supported. So we're gonna change that. Uh, so let's just change it to 0.11.0.2 because that's my my Java version and let's check again cool so it's it does a, a lot more and th this is actually quite okay um, so to summarize how to set up your environment I'm gonna kill this one and we're going to check that in a minute mm -hmm. um, so to summarize uh, uh, to summarize it you have to to uh, to configure your um, configure your IntelliJ, you have to set the target Java version in your POMXML uh, here, and you have to set your uh, Java version, and then you're good to go. So, Hanno, if you can take it away. So it'll be like this. In the remainder of the talk, we'll just try to upgrade a bit of this open hub solution that our manager asked us to, and. Um, while we're working on it, I'll just share a bit of interesting theory about upgrading or migrating strategies or new features. So let's dive into it. This, this demo we already did. So um, let me tell you a bit about our approach and where we started when we did this at our project. Um, so firstly, uh, after we did the migration, I wrote an article in the local Java magazine, which is in Dutch in this case. So there's a link there. So for everyone who's capable of reading Dutch, please, please go ahead and click on it. Um, we've described a few of our, um, of our challenges and the things the, that, we, uh, that we came across in this article, but it will also be in the next slide, so keep listening. Um, I think we based our strategy uh, on an excellent uh, blog post um, that we linked here, um, which is about migration and how you can do this incrementally. So. Uh, when we started, I thought that, well, this will be a, quite a, a big task. And, uh, you know, how many sprints are we going to work on it? Do we need to block like the next four sprints? And it turned out we didn't really have to because migration can be done incrementally. So as you'll uh, probably know, uh, you can use a newer Java version to run code that has been compiled with an older Java version. And, you just need to set some uh, compatibility flags and then, then you're okay. So the first step you could do is uh, install a Java 11 JRE and try to uh, run your uh, Java 8 compiled sources and see if it still works. This is, a, this is a small step that can be done quite easily. Then the second stage of the migration could be what Peter was trying to do. Just now compile with Java 11 and see if anything breaks, try to fix it. And then after compilation has been successful, you can start using the module system that was introduced in Java 9, uh, if you want. So let's dive into it. 
uh, running with Java 11 will in a lot of cases will just will just work. The only really significant change that has happened in, uh, in, in the Java 11 JRE is, is that there are no more Java EE or Corma dependencies. They are not uh, readily available uh, for the JVM. So uh, if you have relied on these dependencies in your software, then running with Java 11 will not work instantly. Um, but most of the applications that I've worked on don't rely on them anyway. So uh, it worked quite, quite quickly with our project. So, what do you need to do still? You need, of course, you need to download the JDK and you need to upgrade your IDE to get the newer JDK support. So also when Java 14 drops in, uh, in a few weeks and you want to start using it, you would have to update your IDEs to get the Java 14 uh, feature support again. And if you uh, relied on one of these dependencies that we've stated here, then you need to add some explicit dependencies and to be able to use them. So for example, Java activation is one of them or Java XML bind. So you would just add, have to add a few more dependencies and then you would be good to go. So let's dive into compiling. What will happen if you try to compile it? Uh, well, what the, the first one we actually saw uh, in the output that the page had just produced because um, uh, some packages that were accessible until Java 10 stopped being accessible uh, starting from Java 11. Um, well, this has been the case for a while now because starting from Java 9, these were warnings that you would get when you were, would compile. So there would be a warning that said um, illegal reflective access uh, to a certain package. And um, they will still appear if you, uh, if you try to compile with Java 11. Uh, ultimately, uh, it's, it's, it's important that you stop using these packages. Um, and of course, the most easy case would be if you would use these packages directly, so that will, there will be imports uh, at the top of your Java files that said uh, sun.star or something with internal in it. Um, but mostly this is not the case. They are typically used by your dependencies. So for example, if you use Spring or another library, um, maybe they will use the internal packages. And it could also be the case that it, this happens transitively. So it could also be a dependency that you really didn't even know that you used. Um, so it's quite helpful if you use Maven or Gradle to examine the dependency tree and see what dependencies uh, you, you are, you're using and which ones maybe are uh, trying to access inaccessible packages. Um, so typically this is the case. So what you can do is upgrade all your dependencies to the latest stable version. And uh, if you're using Maven, a good uh, place to start is the versions Maven plugin that will report to you what the newest stable versions are so that you can change them quite quickly. Well, if you have done, done all these things and compilation with Java 11 is successful, then you can, uh, you can choose to use modules if you want. And so this has been introduced in Java 9. I'm going to talk a bit more about it later. Um, but, but the key, key information is that you can state in a separate module manifest which modules you depend on and what packages in your component are, must be accessible at compile time and at runtime. I'll elaborate on it a bit further on in the talk. So stay tuned for that. I think it's time for another demo. Don't, don't you think so, Peter? Yes. Let me share my screen. So here it is. Um, so if we go to the, the root of this project and we just type in Maven compile, then it fails. I did, did it already, but I'm going to show you anyway. Um, so it's, it's going somewhere. It's, it's compiling some modules and here we see it fails. So it would be a very short talk if it's, if it's already done. So for that purpose, it, it, uh, uh, it fails. Um, so we have to check why it fails. And if we check here, we have the bundle model persistence. So it's not really important what it is, but this project uses uh, EMF, Eclipse Modeling Framework. And with this framework, you can define your, your models and from these models, you can generate uh, code. And as you might uh, know or might understand that you need the last versions of this plugin. So, uh, so apparently 
this plugin isn't up to date. So it's very important to update your plugins. Always, not always, but um, uh, do it from time to time. Then it will, uh, you don't run into trouble if you migrate your Java version. So that's very important. And if we have a look, uh, what's actually the problem, then we see it here. We see some warnings. So these are the warnings uh, Hanno talked about. So got some illegal reflection. Uh, yeah, so that's not, not allowed. And we see here an exception, the MWE2 launcher. So you don't have, probably you don't have to dive in the exact um, um, uh, exception or what it is or what it causes. Um, but often you can just um, update the plugin. So that's what we're going to do now. So we're going to, to go to the, to the uh, bundle. So let me dive in bundle and then we go to model.persistence. Persistence, persistence. Okay, so let me check that again. Uh, so this is, has to fail again. So this works actually. I know it from experience, mm -hmm. but running it uh, um, after each other doesn't work. And here we see that the Java version is not compatible. So that, that confirms that we have to have a newer version of this plugin. So what we can do is we can check if our plugins are not up to date. So let me check. Um, so this is the this is the, the versions plugin, and you can you can uh, run that, and that will tell you which plugins are not up to date. And we see a lot of uh, uh, things that are not up to date. So we have for the Go Gen, we have a new version. We have a JDK compiler, and the, all all these plugin we have to update. So. Uh, to do that, to do that, we going to bundles and we going to to model the persistence, and let me check. So we have some dependencies here. So uh, here they define the build, and we see some SLF4J, and we see here the org uh, dot eclipse dot extend plugin, and that's I. That's essentially the, the root cause of our problem because that um, plugin um, is failing. So we have to update that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just update it. So let's go to the compile model, which defines the uh, versions for this, uh, for this bundle. So we have a lot of versions here. It's a bit strange why this project do it this way because we have emf.1, emf.3, and we have two MWE versions. So this is different than this versions. And we see here that um, org.eclipse.xText uses the xText version. So you can imagine it's quite a puzzle because all these dependencies have to work with each other. And that's uh, quite a challenge sometimes. And if just updating the plugins, might help, but uh, doesn't all the time. Um, so what we can do is we can check um, for newer versions of this build of materials. So to do that, we go to the build of materials. That's the easy way. Um, and then compile a model. So here we are now. So let's me check. Yeah, we are here. So uh, we're going to run the versions plugin again and then we will see that the newer versions for uh, uh, the code gen but also for x text uh, for code gen so we see a lot of different versions uh, for the plugins that are used so um, what we can do is we can just upgrade them and let's do that for a moment then we uh, i think we use emf.common and then we I have to use the emf.1 version. So we're gonna just try it. We will, we will see if it, if it succeed. 
in the end it will succeed i can tell you that but we just going to see then we're going to experience which problems you're going to face so we just changing this version and because we have some some serious issues with the mwe2 uh, launcher we're going to update that um, too so let me check if they got a new version so yeah so instead of 2.9.1. a date uh, we can use 2.11.2 so that's convenient so 2.11.2 so perfect so if so we see already there is some some failure so Eclipse is trying to resolve these dependencies and I hope I, uh, this is the, the version that's compatible. Uh, we're going to check, we're going to wait for just a sec. Otherwise I'm going to downgrade it for one for a version I know that does work. So let me just change that to, to, to this version and I think this will work perfectly. Um, in any case, we're going to just try it. Uh, Eclipse is in the background uh, checking for a new version. And we're going to maybe uh, let's go back to the bundle. Um, the bundle that causes the trouble. So let's go to bundles and then uh, see model.persistence. So we're going to run this again. And I hope it works. We're going to find out. Cool. So this is actually quite okay. So it doesn't generate any issues. And here we have the same issue again. So it's not the right version yet. Um, so we're going to upgrade this again. So we have 19. That should be fine. So you can imagine, as I said, it's quite a puzzle. And we did the, some puzzles for you. Uh, we did the puzzling, so I hope this, this works better now. So we're going to find out. So this can actually be caused because the X text, um, we have redefined the X text. I'm going to search for it. Uh, X text Maven plugin. So this is it is is it it is used in a lot of different build of materials, and we actually define the version here. So we're going to upgrade the XX version, and we can the XX version is defined at the top. So here, so we're going to upgrade that too to two point nineteen. Cool. So now it's it's resolving all the dependencies in IntelliJ, and we're gonna run it again. So let's hope for the demo gods it works. And I think it will. And otherwise I have prepared some, uh, some versions that definitely work. But you, you get a sense for, sense for that it can be quite a puzzle. Cool. So this is a different, uh, it's a, so this is a different error. And this is always, if you're migrating, it's, it's sometimes um, trial and error. So you have to just figure out which versions do work and especially in such a big project, it, it can be quite a challenge. And I'm gonna uh, figure it out uh, why it doesn't work in just a minute. And then Hanno can tell you something about the new Java, uh, the new Java features, I think. And then I will, I will um, continue. So, um, as Peter has uh, demonstrated, it's uh, the first step should be to keep your dependencies up to date, and you can. It's a bit of trial and error. Actually, we really drove our product owner quite mad while we were in this process because every time she would ask us, "Are you done yet? How many sprints will you still need?" and we would just say, "Yeah, we got like." eight piles of logging, but we're not sure how many, much logging is, <laughs> is left if we have, when we have fixed everything. So it's just, you just solve the, your issues one by one, but there's not, not, no, not really a way to tell how long it will take. <laughs> you just have to fix them all. Um, yeah, so if you want some best practices about upgrading dependencies, there's a, there's a good website that you can visit. We also 
use this one while we're migrating. So um, I think the missing modules demo will be a bit later. Yeah. Um, so we'll circle back to that. I'll talk a bit about new features. So while Peter is uh, investigating his, his output, um, because we haven't really talked about why we would want to upgrade anyway, um, or uh, what new features will await you if you're upgrading. Of course, you want to upgrade because you want to run a supported version and Java 8 is not supported anymore, but um, you could choose to upgrade to Java 11, or you could choose to upgrade to 13 or 14 in a few weeks, and maybe it's good to know why. Um, so what will be available? Uh, so um, I'm doing the assumption here that you, most of you are still on Java 8, so if you're on Java 11, forgive me for uh, talking a bit out about Java 9 and 10. Um, I have uh, put the, the biggest new feature per Java version here on this slide. There are, of course, more new features, but we, can't, we don't have time to, uh, to present them all. I think uh, besides the module system, I think the J shell, so the read if I'll print loop in Java 9 is uh, one of the biggest feature. Uh, which is, I'm, I'm, I don't have time to show it right now, but it's like a command line in interpreter where you can test out your Java code, the Java code snippets. Uh, when I saw it the first time, it immediately reminded me of the, Java, uh, of the Python interpreter, which works kind of the same way. You can just type Python, press enter, and you can input your Python code. The same thing is now uh, possible with the J shell. Uh, test out a few uh, code snippets or for quick demos. So it's a, it's a nice tool and it's easily learned, so check it out. Um, starting with Java 10, the big new feature was local variable type inference. This has been in the C Sharp language for quite some time, so it's great that it's, it's, it's found its way to Java also. So with local variables, um, you can skip the type in the declaration. So in this case, I'm, I'm using a a big decimal, and um, uh, I'm putting it in the variable called price, but I don't have to repeat the big decimal data type right here. It, it's implicit, and the compiler can infer it from context. Um, so you can use this in a, lot, in a lot of places, but keep in mind that it's, it's for local variables only, so no instance variables, no static variables, no class variables, just for local method variables. This will work. And also, I'm not sure if you should go overboard with it. So in this case, it's a good use case because it's very clear from context that we're dealing with a big decimal here. There's just no argument. I mean, this must be a big decimal. Um, so then in a code review, if I see big decimal stated here, and then I could say, why don't you use some local variable type inference here? Um, but if this would be like a method that we created by ourselves, but the name is not chosen well, and we're not sure just by the class name and the method name what the return type will be, then it will be a good idea just to just state the data type again. So, so just try to read from context if you want to use this or not. But like in cases like this, it's, it's, uh, it's great, I think. So in Java 11, one of the new features was single file source code. Um, now, I'm not sure if everyone remembers this, but in the good old days, when we didn't have IDEs, uh, compiling and running a Java program would be a two-step process. You, first, you run Java C, and then your Java class. This would be, result in a class file, and then you could run Java class file, and it would run the Java code. Um, well, this is not necessarily the case anymore, starting from Java 11, because uh, single files can be run directly with just the Java command. Uh, this is the single file source code feature. Uh, there are a few uh, conditions though. Um, there must be a single class definition in this file. So no inner classes, no private classes uh, further below in the file. Also, it must have a main method in the, in the classic sense of the word. So it must be a public static void main string or args or far, far. Um, and if, if that's the case, then you can just run it by, by running Java space and then the Java file. Also, if you're a bit into Unix scripting, you can also uh, run this program as a script. So in, in, in bash shells, for example, you can, you can use, uh, you can use dot slash and then you can 
specify the Java file if you, uh, if you include this header. So a shebang and then the path to a Java executable, a source flag, and then you can use the, the dot operator slash and then the Java file to run it script-like, just like in bash scripting. So that's, that's kind of cool. Then in Java 12, this is the big one, switch expression. So we were used to switch statements, which would not yield any results. They would just be statements. Um, but if you want your switch expression to yield a result, you can. So this switch expression is, is valid now. So I taught a few courses for info support and uh, when I need to uh, provide a code example, I always use beer as a, as a domain because it makes me happy. <laughs> Not too much, of course. But, um, so these are a few beers that, that, that I have standing in my cupboard. Um, and um, uh, you, we, we, it's, it's a very arbitrary style, code style. I mean, we're just switching on a, an enum type and we're creating new beer instances. I mean, it could be better, but just, this is just to demonstrate the switch expression. Um, whoops, sorry. Um, and the result of this switch expression will be stored in this variable. And of course, I've, I've done local variable typing first here again. Um, so notice that the default case is, is no longer necessary per se. You can still provide it, um, but it's not, not mandatory anymore. If, if each, uh, each case uh, results to a value, it will simply be if, if here is another enum value, then this will just be null. So it could be like that and it, it works like this. Java 13, the new feature is text blocks. Um, we're all, I think we're all very used to string concatenation and when we want to use new lines and strings, we just have to put these new line characters in and of course they had to be specific for the operating system that we were running on. So you had to use the system.line separator method or something like that. Um, starting from Java 13, you can just, um, in one literal, you can just provide your string. And uh, so what you need is the triple quotes. So of course we are used to single quotes, well, single double quotes actually. Um, now you have to do that character three times and then you can provide your string um, like that. Um, so two things are important to, uh, to keep in mind when you're using this. Um, all new lines will uh, by default be for the right operating system. So the operating system specific new line character will be used here. So that's great, no extra processing necessary. And also um, all the indenting that, that is right here. So this part here is omitted. So the indenting starts from the point where you place your first double quote. So here it starts, so there will no, be no top or no space character right here. And here we'll insert four spaces, four spaces, and here no spaces again. So it depends on the placement of these three characters. And then the new method uh, format that you can use to provide a, a parameter uh, injection like this. Um, we used to do this by wrapping a string with the string.format factory method, but now you can also use the formatted method on any string. Java 14 is due to uh, be released in a few weeks, and the biggest feature in Java 14 is records. Um, this is like a new type of class, actually. So you can provide a record, for example, for this, uh, for this example, we, we uh, chose a bank transaction with a date, an amount, and a description. And um, this really is the equivalent of a data class. So this is a concept that we use very often in our, in our domains. We need to have representations of the entities that we create in our, uh, in our applications. And if you provide Java with a record, it will, Java will generate a lot of code for you under the hood. Um, so I'll have, I'll have an example in the next slide, but first a bit about records. So they are data carrier classes and they are implicitly final. Also, they cannot extend any other class. So it's a very basic concept. All fields are also private, private final by default. Um, and you can define the fields like in a, some sort of constructor type declaration. And this also means you cannot add any extra instance fields, just the ones that you had between the brackets. These are the, the, the concepts that will be generated for you. There will be a constructor, there will be getters. 
an equals implementation and hash code implementation and a two string implementation. And just to get a bit of an idea how this works or what, what will be generated for you, we have provided the generated version of our uh, record class. So if you compare these two code examples, being this being a one liner and this, I'm not sure how many lines it is, but it looks like well over 30. Um, it's quite a, it's quite an improvement in, in brevity. So that's, that's great. Um, one thing to keep in mind, maybe you have, you've um, been used to this because you have you've been using a library like Lombok, for example. I think the implementations are quite similar, but this is a, this is a big difference. The getters are not called, called get, they are just called uh, after the fields they were generated for. So keep in mind that if you want to use the getters, or I think in the official terms we call them accessors. If you want to use these accessors, make sure you, you use the exact field name and not, not a get prefix. I, I can personally can't wait to, to use this feature and see how it works. So I'm really excited for Java 14 and hope, hope you, you also are. So a final slide about performance improvements because besides the new features, you also get a bit of performance improvements. Um, I always tend to forget about performance improvements, but there are a lot of people who are researching this. And um, this is a nice blog. Uh, with regular blog posts about how the different uh, JDKs are performing. Um, uh, so uh, these are some, some cool graphs that, that are part of the blog post and you can see that a few examples that this person prepared perform differently. Uh, so for Java 9 it even increased a bit and then it, it slowly decreased. So it means the performance is gradually getting better. So even if you don't really like the new features, you can still benefit from upgrading. And the same holds true for the memory footprint of your application. So if you're interested, check the link out. It's a great blog about performance on the new Java versions. Is it time for another demo, Peter? Um, and I investigated the problems. Uh, and I want to share a problem with you. So, um, I'm, so I made a, a few commits to, to show you some errors you, you will experience during this process. And one error I found, um, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, is uh, this one. Cool. So this one you're going to see a lot. So this is a dependency clash. And we're going to invest investigate that further. So let me just copy this for you. This seems a little cryptic because it's a lot of dependencies involved with, uh, with some versions. And uh, let me just make a new note. So, uh, cool. So this is the dependency and then, yeah. So um, let me just, if I can zoom in for just a minute. Uh, no. So I'm gonna do this this way. So could not resolve conflict among these dependencies. So um, this is seems a little cryptic, so the way you have to, you can read it is as, as follows. So xtext.generator uses uh, xtext.generator uh, and we see here that uh, these, dependency don't, these dependencies don't clash, but you have to look out for the, the comma and I think we have it here. So what we see here is we see a different version for the Launcher, yeah. So I puzzled with the version, so I made it, as we have seen in the pre previous demo, uh, there are uh, different versions. And this is actually quite okay. So we have 2.11.2. Um, however, if we're going to investigate it, hey, hey we see here MBE, MWE2, we use 2.9.1. And I think we also use a different version, if I can see it here. So Maven doesn't know which version it, uh, it, it must use. So does it have to use 2.9.1 or 2.11.2? .2? So that's, yeah, so it, that's very difficult, um, but that's a dependency clash and I, just change the versions and you can do some exclusion. So you can explicitly tell 
that uh, uh, the launch has to exclude or which version is that i think it's the xtext generator that uses the uh, the mwe2 runtime to exclude this specific version so yeah so we can do that or we can just uh, make the versions more uh, compatible with each other and that's what i've done so i have here as you might have seen um, uh, some practical tips and the 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 very also tip from us is to to keep track of your fixes so what i've done is as you can see uh, i have some some git commits prepared and um, I suggest you do the same if you're going to migrate. So if you have a fix, commit it and then go, uh, go um, further. So you can always go back to your previous commit. So you see that I have some, I took some steps and I have updated the X text and I resolved the dependency issue. So let me just go to that version where I fixed the dependency. Oh, uh, let me copy that again. Cool. So we resolved the dependency issues and I, I can see what I fixed. You can, I can show it, I can prove it to you. Um, cool. So we did an, um, so we add an exclusion. So we excluded the MWE runtime in the, uh, in the compile model POM XML. So let me, oh, let me go back here. So let me check POM.XML and let me check what we've, what we've added. So exclusion, 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 exclusion. So it's not, it's not in here or it is. So as we've seen, the XTech generator uses the MWE runtime and we explicitly tell Maven that we don't have to use this uh, version that this version of the XTEC generator uses. So that, this is part of the puzzle. If you have some dependencies that use the same dependencies, you can have a clash. Cool. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you uh, the situation after we, we uh, updated our plugins. Oh, so we have the same thing. Git check out. Cool. So let me check. Maven clean compile. So because our project and if yours do too uh, uses Xtext, um, you it can be very beneficial to use clean because it cleans your target uh, folder and you do have to do that often. Uh, that's also the reason um, I had a puzzle in the beginning. I did indeed didn't do a clean so it uses some old generated code and therefore I got the same uh, error again and again and again so that's that's quite a puzzle so do a clean sometimes if you think why is this happening do a clean and I hope I hope this works so we are actually at 27 if you can see that so that's that's good and if if you see and like you see, it's very, it takes a lot of time to gather, gather feedback. So if you change just a version, um, it can take some time that you get a feedback if you run the bundles again and over again and again and again. So it can be very, very beneficial if you could just go to the build of materials or just go to the specific bundle and figure out the problem there and then go back to the bigger picture and try to, to run compile um, over all the uh, different modules. You can have a problem when different modules depend on each other. So you have to really figure out how to, how that it uh, functions. So I hope this works. Um, so it's generating some code and I check it's at 30. So we have 101 bundles and it's at 30. So it can take some time. In the meantime, I'm going to show you another demo I've, i prepared a demo uh, is, which is really simple but it it, it demonstrates the problem hanno told you about uh, about the missing modules so 
we have a Maven project again, and we have an employee. We modeled an employee, and we modeled this. Okay, so it needed my attention. <laughs> cool. Um, yes. So we see an employee, and we want to parse it into XML. So if you, uh, as you have seen in the in the in the uh, slide of Hanno, the Java X dot XML dot bind is not included anymore in the Java uh, in, in Java version 11. So, but to demonstrate that, I'm going to compile this, and I'm showing you we are on, on 1.8. So, yeah, just just have a look. So we're going to change our Java home to Java 8, and we're just going to to uh, compile it. It's maybe clean compile and we're going to check if that actually worked so this this fine built success great so now we're going to upgrade this project to java 11 and we're going to say maven compile so now i hope it fails and we have a success so this is actually a good thing because we didn't uh, didn't do a clean so target folder was already there and we uh, and it uses that um, folder so it said nothing to compile all classes are up to date so there was a time that i went to hano and said i fixed it i did the upgrade to java 11 and then figured out i didn't do a clean and that's very frustrating from time to time so so do a clean sometime do a clean cool so if we do a clean and we do clean compile then we see it fails look perfect it fails uh, the only time I'm very happy if the if the build if a build failure is there. So we see that what we expect the Java X dot XML dot bind does not exist, and uh, that's what we expect as Hanno told us. So to fix this, we have to explicitly define those dependencies. So we have still Java. Uh, 1.8 uh, there, but it's for the Maven compiler plugin, which we don't use. And here we see, I already prepared some um, dependencies and we explicitly add Java x.xml.bind and Java x.annotation because we need both. Uh, let me check, yeah, cool. So hope this will fix the issue. So we do a Maven clean compile, clean compile, Maven clean com, clean compile, cool. So now it should work and it works. So it, it detected changes because we cleaned the target folder and that's perfect because uh, we did a clean um, and therefore it works. So if you've got problems and you think why, uh, it cannot find Java X dot XML dot bind dot annotation, for example, and just add it. Check if the if the model is on the list of exclusions or the Java uh, uh, the modules that are uh, removed from the version and if from the version uh, Java 11. And if it is, you have to explicitly edit. You can run into trouble if other um, other dependency use those um, use use those dependency explicitly and then you have to exclude which one you have to uh, which one you uh, don't want to use so that's the problem i, I showed you earlier and i hope cool yay. yay so this so the build is success we have uh, we have some uh, we have all the modules all compiled and now let's test it because we don't we want to we want to show it really works and um, before we set the house on fire of our manager, because some code is not, isn't tested, we have to test it. And I think we run into trouble there. I don't know if we go into that problem. Um, let me just check. So we do some Maven test and uh, then it should be fine, I think. Uh, so it's going over the process again and again. So this is the long road, so the long feedback loop. You have to do that sometimes. Uh, but I think this works. 
So that's perfect. And I think we, this ends the demo, I think. Yeah. And we can go back to Hanno to, to have some uh, additional information. I want to talk a bit about release schedule. So thank you for the demo, Peter, very helpful. Um, one of the reasons why you should start to think about migrating is because the release schedule has changed since Java 8. Many of you have heard about this already. So I'll, I thought just to show you a quick slide on this. So uh, historically, we wouldn't really be sure when a new Java version would be released. Uh, most of the times um, at Oracle and also other companies would work together to uh, finish a few jabs. And when they were finished and tested, then there would be a new release. And this is one of the reasons why Java 8 took so long, for example, because it had the major new labdas and method reference features in it. Um, but because the JDK has also been mod modular, modularized, um, a, a quicker release schedule became possible. And, and this is the schedule that we're on right now, uh, which means each, every six months there will be a new Java version. So you can know before, so right now you can already know when the next one is uh, released. For example, Java 14 will be on the 17th of March, and then again in September, and then again in March, and then again in September. And each six months there will be a new version. But also, uh, every three years, so in this case, it will be every six versions, one version will be marked as a long-term support release, and the, last, the, the most recent one was Java 11, and it will be supported for a longer time, so like five years. Of course, this is Oracle commercial support, so you, you still have to pay for it if you want the official Oracle or JDK. There are also alternatives like the Open JDK, or you can just uh, keep switching from version to version uh, and, and be on the Oracle JDK. So it's up to you. And in fact, you can choose with your project if you want to do a small migration every six months with, with just a few small changes, maybe not even breaking changes, or you want to don't do anything about migration for like three years and then migrate everything at once. And then, then it will be a big migration. So in that case, you really have to reserve a sprint or two or not sure how big this step will be, but this step was quite big. So um, you can't really be sure how much time you need to spend to make sure that you can upgrade. So um, in fact, you can choose what upgrading schedule you want to follow. Of course, the benefit of using this route is that you, you have already access to these new features that we told you about. So and you can really spread out the work a bit. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of uh, platforms that you'll be using anyway, like for example, uh, build servers or static code analysis, uh, will probably just use the LTS version. So you have to find your own way, I guess. Um, I promise you to talk a bit about modules more. So why don't we do it, do it just now? Um, when I think of the module system, I always think to myself, what will happen if I don't do anything? What will happen if I ignore the module system? Will my software still work? What will happen if I will adopt them fully? And what will happen if I do something in between? Is this also possible? So mod the module system was called Project Jigsaw, uh, one of the biggest additions to the Java ecosystem because it was more than 10 years of work. And the main goals were a separation of concerns and information hiding. Actually, uh, these are the same goals that um, that made Java uh, um, this language to begin with, because when Java was, was created, these were also goals, but they were on an entirely different level. They were within a class. So there was very uh, good support for visibility modifiers early on, like private and public and uh, projected, um, but they were on a class level. And Jigsaw really uh, takes this to the next level and makes sure that you can, do, you can achieve these goals on a module level, so for a component or for a group of packages. Um, the JDK itself has also been modularized and, and this is actually quite a concise overview of the, the different modules in the JDK because um, it used to be a lot worse. There used to be a lot more um, arrows before it was modularized. Um, and this is the module that is the base of everything Java based. So every Java application needs to have this one, but you can just add other modules of the JDK to your system if you want. And if you don't want to, you don't have to use them. 
and they won't have to be loaded into memory. So maybe your application can run a bit faster. So what if you would get started with modules, you would need a, a module descriptor. Um, in the module descriptor, you can, uh, you can specify a module name. Of course, there's still code and packages in, in your module and there's data and resources. And here's the module descriptor, which is the module info.java. Um, it looks a bit like this. So there's a module keyword for the module info.java. You specify the module name and you can explicitly state, I'm exporting this package and I'm requiring these modules. There are a few options in here, and here is an overview of uh, the most important ones. So if you export your packages, then it means that all, all code um, that is public can be accessed uh, on compile time, and all the public code can also be accessed via reflection. Qualified exports are just a special type of export where you specify uh, certain modules that can access your, uh, your, your modules. <clears throat> if you want to uh, to allow reflection access, you have to explicitly state this by declaring your package open or your entire module uh, open. So if you don't do this, um, reflection is not possible. So this is actually an improvement because reflection used to be possible on everything uh, before the module system. You could just inject some variables, some, some values in private variables and via reflection and that would just work, which is very yucky. So uh, there are a lot more tools in your toolbox to, to make sure that this doesn't, this doesn't happen anymore. So how does this actually apply to my situation? You might ask yourself, well, this is a thing that I always like to keep in mind. What will be the status quo? What will happen if I don't do anything? Well, this is what will happen. Each jar that you produce that hasn't got a module info Java will become an automatic module, which means that all packages will be exported by default. This is actually the behavior that everyone has gotten used to. So a, a Java 8 application will be, when, when it is used as a dependency, all packages are accessible. You can use them compile time. And the jar will be on the class bus as usual. But if you're using modules, you can, you can uh, specify yourself which packages are available and which ones are not. So this is a, probably a good idea when you're developing a library or uh, some sort of uh, API uh, that of which you know that other people will use it and you can export your interface definitions, for example, and keep your implementations private. So would, you, would we advise migrating legacy code to modules? I think we advise against it. I have to admit we did it. We did actually did this at the project that we referred to in the, in the start of the talk, but it took us a lot of time. Um, because there was no way for us to know in detail which components needed which packages. This was just a trial and error process. We just said, let's start using modules and one by one we had to fix all kinds of problems. Um, I think they are better achievable in a Greenfield project because uh, you can start thinking about encapsulation better. You can st start preventing your reflective access. Now, of course, if your legacy coder is well structured, you could try it. But if you're not really sure what the structure is, which happens in a lot of cases, if you take over a project, then it's not a very good idea. Still, if you want to do this in a Greenfield project, your dependencies need to be modularized too. And so you could still want to start using modules, but you really you have to uh, depend on your dependencies being modularized too. Um, if you're interested in this topic, this is a very good blog about, sorry, about what is the state of Java modularization? Um, because it will only be easy if all your dependencies also are modularized. Uh, otherwise you would uh, run into problems like split packages, for example. I'll talk a bit about split packages in a few minutes. Um, so this is what you have to keep in mind. Um, Time for another demo first, uh, Peter. So, as I've sh showed you, uh, we are on Java 11 now. So, that's perfect. And now you're going to continue, or now we are going to continue to 13. So, I hoped to, to demo this to Java 14, because, but I didn't, uh, uh, didn't get to download an open JDK version. So, but 13 is, I think, good enough. Uh, the changes between Java 13 and Java 14 aren't that back, big. So that's, I think that's, that's good for now. Let me check. We are in Java 11. So now let's check. So we are on 
30.0.2 and we just continue we do the same cycle again so we're just going to check if it compounds and let's clean compound cool so we have seen this error again and this is the very first error um, some enforcer rules have failed so this is just the the, the, the next cycle we're going to, we have to uh, we have to um, change the java version and uh, let me and look that up. So we're going to the main POM XML and then we see uh, at the bottom the Java version which uh, which we changed early on. So we have to we have to change this and then we're going to do the same uh, again and again uh, and uh, figure out which dependencies aren't uh, compatible, um, update your dependencies and uh, Often your dependencies um, causes some trouble in your code, some um, methods that are deprecated, and then you have to fix those. Uh, luckily in this project, that hasn't been the case, but uh, sometimes you don't have backwards compatib uh, compatibility, and then you, you run into trouble. So that causes a lot more trouble, but that's on the code, and that's very uh, dependent on your use case. Um, so we, go, we won't go into that. Um, so um, I, I think I'm just going to run a maybe clean compile and then we can continue the slides, I think. I know. Um, yeah, so let me check. Yeah, good. So that's running. So challenges during, during a migration. I guess this will be our final topic before we wrap it up. Um, there are a lot of challenges that we encountered during our migration and Peter has shown you a lot of them already, which, is really, which was really our intent. You know, ju not just some, some some shiny business talk about how everything is awesome, but just something from the trenches, you know, it's something that's real, something that will happen to all of you. And it's nothing to be ashamed about. Um, and these are the things that also happen to us. Maybe you can learn from it. So I already told you at the start that um, we started migrating to Java 11 very early, uh, actually on the day that Java 11 was released. And we ran into problems right away because of, uh, one of our projects was using Lombok and Lombok didn't have any Java 11 support until over a month later, which is still quite fast uh, in my opinion. But uh, at the time we thought, wow, haven't we started a bit too early? I mean, n no one in the Java world is using Java 11. And we are one of the first and we are relying on software from other people, you know, dependencies like Lombok. So we had to wait for this version of Lombok to support Java 11, so um, had to ignore a lot of warnings until this one was released. Same for Jenkins, actually. We, we used Jenkins as a build server and it, the full 11, Java 11 support arrived in March 2019. So, um, of course, we could just uh, use a, a Java 11 JDK uh, to compile against, but our Jenkins masters and agents couldn't run with it. So. It, it took until March 2019 to make sure that that worked. Um, and also, I've looked it up for you. Um, they, don't, they don't have a, an upgrade strategy that will follow all the new releases. So they will support LTS releases only. So you have to run your Jenkins using an LTS release, and then you, you can use like a, a Docker images as agents to make sure that you are using a Java 13 or Java 14 to compile your, your code. But it has to run on an LTS version. And I think the same thing holds true for SonarCube, your static code analysis tool, or in any case, our code analysis tool. It had full Java 11 support starting from June 2019. So we were already done with the migration, but still had to use a Java 10 mode at SonarCube for a long time until, until Java 11 was supported fully. Also, this also only supports LTS releases to run on. So make sure you, uh, you know uh, what you're up against when you're using SonarCube. Um, then split packages, this is one of the most common problems when uh, implementing modules. Um, this is because Java 9 introduced a module path. This is like on top of a class path. In a module path, each package can appear only once. And this is different from the class path mechanism because a class path can obtain, uh, contain multiple occurrences of the same package. And the runtime behavior then depended on class path order. So the one that was stated first will be used. Um, so to, to improve this, the module path was introduced. And it also was beneficial to performance because 
and class path was just a, a huge array of of, uh, of jar files and class files and with modules the JVM can determine the location of a package more quickly so the scanning uh, scanning has improved performance wise um, but the class path still exists and has still has a pur purpose to list each jar that hasn't been modularized yet so the entire cl class path is therefore treated as an unnamed module so for backward compatibility reasons, it still exports all packages to other modules. It can access all other modules. Uh, so it exists to ensure backwards compatibility. And this is an example of split packages. So imagine you are developing an application um, that requires an API and also requires an implementation module. Um, just for the sake of the example, I'm not sure why you would want this, but this really demonstrates the split package problem. If you try to run this and um, there are uh, packages with the same name in these modules, you will get this error. So this module reads package dependency, com github dependency from both dependency API and dependency IMPL. So this is no longer allowed when using modules. You will see this one a lot <laughs> if you're using modules. So I'm just putting it on the slide so you can recognize it. So in this, in, in, essentially what happens is this package exists twice. It exists in the API module and it exists in the IMPL module. But according to the module path, you can only have one of these. So these are the kind of solutions that you can, uh, can try. And we have used, well, not all four of them, but a lot of them, and <laughs> like three of them. So if this is in your own code, you can just rename the packages. So for example, the package that uh, where the implementations of your interfaces are just re re uh, rename them to IMPL or something just a bit different from the API and you don't have split packages anymore. If it's not your own code and in a lot of cases it won't be your own code it will be dependencies try upgrading to the latest version if you have uh, followed the previous tips you've already done this of course um, and if you are already on the latest version well then you could report the issue to the maintainers of, uh, of the library and hope they fix it or provide a solution yourself and you know send a PR and hope they will merge it because if they don't this is your last resort and you don't really want this it is it is doable but you don't want this to be a permanent solution you could of course uh, compile the dependency yourself create a custom jar of it in which the package is unsplit so for example you have renamed some things or something upload it to your, to your artifactory or your nexus and then use it for the time being until it is fixed in a in the library. I think still think sending a PR is the better way and hoping it gets merged. Um, but it is, it is a solution. More, more information uh, via the link if you want, if you're interested. Yeah, so maybe I think we're at the end right now. Don't you think so, Peter? Uh, yes, we are. And maybe you can just uh, take us through the takeaways of the demos. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna, first I'm going to show you that the build is actually successful. We actually see that the build is success. So we uh, didn't change anything I'm on the, the same commit I was before. So that's cool. So we have a build success and uh, we are on Java version 13. So that's a success. Uh, that's very cool. So that, that's uh, uh, cool. So I will share you the final takeaways uh, from migrating, so yeah. So uh, it's important to prepare your environment. It's not a one day job. If you have a big project, if you've got a small project with microservices, you can do it in one day. If you know the troubles you're going to, uh, uh, you're going to face, uh, otherwise it can take you some, some days and therefore you have to prepare your environment. And that's via aliases, so you can change your Java version and your Java home, and that's very convenient. And otherwise, if you've got a build success, you don't know why you got a build success or you, you have a, a false positive. Um, so, and update your dependencies. If you do that regularly, you, you face these problems one by one and you can tackle those uh, at the time and not when you're migrating your Java version. Uh, so that, that will, e will ease up um, your migration um, and master your tool. So I've shown you some tips, some tips and some tricks with Maven, if you you are uh, um, very, uh, if you master Maven, then you you're going to figure out what the problem is very quickly, and that that's often uh, uh, that will speed up the process very quickly, and that's that's uh, I think uh, very important. 
So th these are the practical tips uh, takeaways. So Hannah, do you got some other takeaways? Yeah, sure. I, I do have a few. Uh, so we've talked a bit about, about our migration strategy and starting from Java 9, you have a choice. You can migrate incrementally um, and you can do it after six months, have a small migration, or you can do it every three years and have a, have a big migration and spend a little bit more time. So choose the one that suits you, your project best. Um, if you are migrating every three years, so in the latter case, beware of migration challenges. And we've named a few of them. Uh, they were quite specific to the, to the 8 to 11 um, uh, migration. But I guess similar things will, will happen if you do 11 to 17 in, in, in some time when 17 is available. Um, so make sure that, uh, that you know that you are going to encounter them. And we also want to stress that modules are a good thing, maybe not for legacy code because you don't get much out of it and will cost a lot of time, but they can be a good thing. Problem is the, the adaptation uh, in the Java world is, is not very fast. So a lot of dependencies don't use modules still. And I still think it's the future. I get the, the best thing it did is that it gave us this new uh, release schedule. So I'm still quite happy with it. Um, but we'll have to wait and see if module, modularization and modularized projects are really picking up in the future. Um, in the meantime, you have seen how you can, you, how you can do it. So I hope that that was useful for you. Um, I think that's it for, from us, uh, according to the takeaway. So if this was a regular talk, we would ask the audience if there were any questions. Of course, uh, we're on the web right now. So if you have any questions, just try to reach out to us on Twitter. Um, our handles are on the screen and we will try to answer your question if you, if you have one. Um, we're very interested to see what uh, you guys and girls are doing in your projects, uh, what, what Java versions you are using. So, uh, so if you want to share, feel free to reach out to us. And um, let me just end the session then by thanking you for your attention. I'm uh, really hoping it was useful and um, hoping you can all migrate successfully to new Java versions and uh, enjoy all the new features. So thanks very much for your time and hope to see you again. Bye. Bye. See you. See you.